Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of our show. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. Today we have with us Paul Casey with Growing Forward Services. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hey, thanks so much, Mike. You're welcome. It's good to have you, and I'd like to just get to know you a little bit and ask uh, you to share with us a little bit about your background and what inspired you to become an entrepreneur and what motivates you to help others. Sure, sure. So I uh, graduated from college with an elementary education degree, became a teacher in the private schools, and uh, became a vice principal pretty quickly after just a couple of years, and then an elementary principal. I was 26 years old, and uh, they said, hey, would you be the principal next year? And I went, well, if you think I can. <laughs> I was like, whoa, <laughs> everybody was older than me, the parents, the board members, the teachers, you know, and I had all this enthusiasm and we're going to make this the best school in the whole world, you know, kind of thing. And I had to learn leadership uh, on the fly. Um, became an administrator then uh, of my own school there. And then I moved over to the uh, the church sector, became a family pastor with that education background, and then an executive pastor um, and so that was my, uh, my work journey. Then along the way, I just sort of realized that every one of those jobs, I think John Maxwell calls it the law of the lid. It's like where I feel like I want to bust out and have new ideas and innovate and grow. And a lot of times systems try to keep you down in the status quo and mired right here. And it just always made me restless. And so, um, I think there's an entrepreneur in me. And so I was like, all right, I, I think I'm going to start this business. <laughs> <laughs> and and so um, one thought that I had when you were mentioning that so many churches feel um, like they are just doing the most horrible thing in the world if they use the word marketing as it relates to their church. But in reality, you have to expand and get the word out. And and I was reading a book just the other day where um, this church, um, this this uh, person had come through and it was talking to this church, and they were just talking about how horrible marketing is um, if for for a church, and that's just such a terrible thing. But then all of a sudden they were like, yeah, but here's our Yellow Page ad, and here's our newspaper ad, and here's our VBS flyers. <laughs> But that's marketing. So um, I think that if you can do marketing the right way and promotion, it really is about seeing a need, finding a gap, and filling it. So that probably is what led you to um, branching out into your current practice, which is, you know, you saw a lead, and Lord, show me where where this open door is or or, or, or the timing of it, because you do feel that pull between an entrepreneurial spirit, but also wanting to bloom where you're planted. So how did you kind of uh, t- um, bring all that together to to uh, move to the next step? Yeah, that's good. I mean, first of all, the, uh, the church has the hope for the world, you know, and so why would you not want to market that and, yep. and reach as many people as possible? But I always found that the church would ditch marketing budget when there's a budget crunch, that was the first line item that would get nixed was, was the marketing budget. Like, oh, okay, well, maybe they'll just come, you know, or our people yeah. will be so good at telling each other and inviting that they'll come. And I, I didn't see that play out. And so that would get hacked to pieces and be like, oh. And then, then I watched the business world, you know, trying to do best practices of marketing. And if the church lagged too far behind from that, there was a disconnect. And it's like, wow, you don't seem very professional about your – your strategies there. And so in a way you sort of have to keep up, but I get that, I get that tension though. Of people going, Oh no, the church shouldn't market. You know, they're totally different, but yeah. So I was always wanting to, uh, you know, get the reader, get an electronic reader board out front and, yeah. and uh, do some creative uh, outreach activities and try to be in the community, not just have to say y'all come to the church because people don't do that very much anymore. I wanted to be uh, like salt and light in the community. Like, Hey, you, you, you're at a church, and what are you doing here at the Chamber of Commerce meeting? I, I don't really get it. And it became yeah. a talking point then. Yeah, that's that's it's it's a perfect mix, and I think that too many people think that 
well, Sunday morning and Sunday night is church, so let me put that hat on. And then, hey, Monday morning, this is my business life, so let me put that hat on. <laughs> and it's it's more of an integrated life. You know, it's it's your living testimony. It's your, you know, the way you do things. People, you know, if you were, what would condemn you to being um, a follower of Christ? Well, hopefully people have something where it would, yep, gotcha, you, you're, yeah, you, yeah, that's exactly right. But it's the I saw a skit once where this uh, church group came through our church and and uh, they did it, the skit where this it, it came down to the end of it where this girl was like, "What? We've been roommates for two years. I never knew you were a Christian." And what a what a sad state of affairs that is. So yeah, being able to have that integrated life is is what it's all about. Um, and and I, I see that you've got a book, The Static Cling Principle. What uh, moved you and motivated you to write that book? Yeah, so I was doing my laundry. <laughs> hey, really nice. I was pulling my clothes apart and get that electric shock, you know, and realize I didn't put in my, my little dryer fabric softener sheet, you know. And I don't know, something clicked. This was probably <clears throat> six years before I actually wrote the book, so it's been in my head a long time. And how this is a, a metaphor for for life uh, and leadership. And, of course, for a speaker, everything becomes a metaphor, you know. So I... You know, I'm at an intersection. I'm like, oh, just that, that interaction right there becomes a metaphor. <laughs> so I'm a little OCD with that. But so I'm doing my laundry and realize, wow, it's what we put onto our life and what we pull off of our life really determines our success. So that's the subhead of the book is what you uh, decide to attach to your life will alter your future. So it's what do you need to, what mindsets, what habits, what people do you need to attach to your life, like static cling, and what things do you really need to pull off? And it's going to give you a shock when you pull it off because it's become your new normal. And yeah. you've got to get some of that stuff off because it's affecting, it's, it's, it's bogging you down in your trajectory of success. You know, and, and I would submit to you, and I think you would agree with this, that um, sometimes we don't realize that there's those things clinging to us and clinging to us, and it's almost like the picture of, you know, just someone just slogging slug, through the mud, and it's just getting so much harder, and they're like, why is this so hard? Well, you've let all this stuff start to cling to, and you don't even know that, that it is yet. Yes, exactly, and that's that's how I start the book off, you know, is, is how do you know if bad stuff is sticking to you, you know, and if it's impacting your day-to-day decisions, if it's becoming your default, you know, and you wake up another day and you're like, what, man, what, what am I doing here? I don't have any intentionality yeah. in my life. And you have no feedback around you that's saying, you know, oh, I'm a little concerned about you. <laughs> then, then it is sticking to you. And, and I would say that the, when, so, when you work with someone to help them move past that, it's just such a um, liberating feeling of, uh, wow, I had, you know, I had no clue that I was under that pressure until it was removed. Yes, and that's the most fulfilling part, uh, Mike, about coaching one-to-one is to see that light go on and to have people go home and do their homework, so to speak, whether that's a values exercise or uh, go interview five people and ask them what the number one thing they think about me is, and they come back, and you're right, that light comes on, and it's just so exhilarating for me as a coach to see somebody break out of that and move, and grow forward, which is why I named my business that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So um, tell me what's the typical type of person that you work with, and you uh, mentioned that you work with them on a multitude of topics. What's some of the main topics and, and areas of coaching that you um, are able to give them the most kind of impact from? Sure, um, and I'll, I'll really meet anybody where they're at. I mean, I'll have clients that do really want to lose weight or um, you know, be a better father or these are the general goals, but I, I would say leadership and self-leadership are my two niches. Um, so sort of that middle manager that really wants to bust out and grow, and they feel sort of like I'm in the status quo, sort of like me. You know, I, I was in that same place. It really helped them to be a phenomenal leader. And then with self-leadership, it really comes down, if I really were to root out, like, what's the core issue? Time management is somewhere in and a lack of intentionality is somewhere back in the root of their issue of why they're stuck. So I really uh, spend a lot of time helping people with time management. What do you find is the most, um, uh, what's the first thing that you can do for someone in the realm of time management that makes the most impact, but also is the easiest for them to um, uh, implement? 
Yeah, well, let me give you two. One of them is to, before you go to bed today or before you leave work today, you need to pick your three top priorities for tomorrow. And as I listen to other podcasts, you know, I hear there's other speakers that are also um, uh, condoning this practice. And when people do that, called the 4, 4.30 preview, whatever your last half hour of the day is, is to look ahead at tomorrow and do a quick flyby. And these are the three big uh, priorities. Then mark them in red on your calendar. You know, they are, write them on a three by five card, go old school, put them on your phone as soon as you pop open, put it on your computer monitor, do something to show. So when you get to work in the morning, hey, I know what my three things are. There's peace of mind in that, going to bed tonight. And there's also your subconscious mind. Research shows your subconscious mind actually starts working on those problems while you're sleeping. So that's pretty cool. It's better than the 5 a.m. getting up and going, all right, what am I going to do today? Yeah. It's, it's just one niche bigger than that. The other thing I, I, that makes the most headway for my clients is to set appointments with yourself. In other words, make every task on your legal pad, that to-do list, which I like to ignore, make it actually into an appointment like 9 o'clock start performance appraisal or you know, 10 o'clock begin marketing campaign uh, in the community, whatever that is, and then you ob- obey your calendar as if it were an appointment yeah. with a person at a coffee shop. You have to do it. You know, I think that's the biggest thing is, yeah, I wrote it down, I put it on my calendar, but then it's so easy to to not do it. You know, it, it should be called the, the you know, the not to do list, um, which actually is a whole other type of a list. You know, you should have those kinds of things on, I will not take calls during my hour of power, I will not, but, but how do you emphasize and help a client make sure that they definitely do those things that they set on, the, on their calendar? Yeah, a lot of times it's, we talk about procrastination because all of us are procrastinators at some level. And I do it too, and we, we take those tasks. I told, first of all, I tell them to front load it in the morning. That's the old Eat That Frog book mm-hmm. by Brian Tracy. Yeah. You know, Brian Tracy. you have to eat the frog, raw frog in the morning. You might as well get it over with and think about it all day. So front load it, all those tasks, into the morning. Overestimate your tasks to get them done faster, like you can gamify it. Try to get the task done before your calendar says you should be done, and then you've just found time. Not really, but yeah. it, it makes it makes it like that was allocated time, and now I can check some more emails. I can use the restroom. I can chit-chat with somebody in the hallway. I've actually got time to do those little things because what I've found, well, Mike, is that afternoons become runaway trains, and yep. if we drag stuff into the afternoon, it's not going to happen. Um, I teach the College of Career Sunday School class at our church, and this past Sunday made this point because we were talking about something to do with time management. And I said, I feel that all of these time management tools um, are uh, have the opposite effect on what they were intended to be. You know, let's use the um, uh, the calendar feature on our phone. Let's um, do these to dos. Let's do these focus things, and let's save some time by using this um, app. And they work. But the problem is you feel like, cool, I got this block of 30 minutes. I'm going to shove something else in there, cram something else in there because I just found 30 minutes when in reality that found 30 minutes. Maybe you put one more thing in that could take 15, but maybe the extra 15 is just finding some margin. Um, if, if, um, I, we went through this series by um, Andy Stanley, um, and it was all about margins and, and you know how to create that in your life. And he had this really neat illustration on the stage. It was this massive closet, and you open it up and everything falls out. And he's like, that's how people's <laughs> lives feel. Then he opens up this other one, and it's like neatly hung up suits and nicely laid out um, uh, pants and shoes. And all of a sudden, it's like... If you can create some margin, and he called it breathing room, now look at what you can feel like. So what do you advise clients on regarding how to use time management, but then how to not let that thing, uh, uh, have things creep up to make it even ineffective? Yeah, and wow, that is so good. And I love the book Margin. Richard Swenson wrote it uh, years ago. And it's how our eyes can't take on a piece of paper that has text from top to bottom, left to right. We have to have white space. So you're right on with that. We've got to have a buffer to absorb the unexpected in our lives. And so instead of cramming it full, which I'm guilty of, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a recovering uh, perfectionist myself, so I know that. But we have to build, so I'll put it in my calendar, the word margin. And I'll put yeah. in these buffers into my calendar, literally. And again, I obey my calendar. So when it says margin, I stop whatever I'm doing. And, uh, again, do the little fill, uh, filler tasks, I call them, or get up and walk around the building to uh, stop being sedentary <laughs> or whatever. And it just makes for a healthier 
uh, rhythm for your day to build that in. And you know, one thing that I would um, even add in, and I'm sure there's a name for this from the coaching world, it probably is something, but I'm just saying that if you notice that you're experiencing that margin and breathing room and it's like, okay, that that actually, I feel good right now. That worked. Why do I, why does it, why do I feel pretty good? And I'm like prepared for my next meeting. I'm 10 minutes ahead. I can kind of take a breather. Well, the reason that I feel this way is I was able to, and then I was, and then I did, and I followed my, hey. And so by going through that mental process and that questioning and that evaluation, you're reinforcing the fact that obeying the calendar and doing these things makes you feel this way, kind of like touching the hot stove. You're probably not going to do it again. So I, I, I guess what I would say is, what do you do to say, okay, now that you feel this way, when you, you know, responded to my coaching session last week and you said, wow, these things have changed, let's talk about why they feel so good so that you can, you know, reiterate and reinforce those. Exactly. This happened uh, just last month with one of my clients. Well, first of all, we get endorphins when we cross off anything off a list. Yep. So achievers, and you're probably a lot of your listening audience are achievers. You know, they're just like, ah, they put things on their list just to cross them off, you know. <laughs> and we get such uh, a thrill. Uh, we get an endorphin rush when we cross it off. But I try to say, what is that peace of mind that you get when you arrive at something feeling peaceful? So she was always late to meetings. And she would arrive three minutes late and she'd be shuffling her papers and didn't get to chit chat with the people in the meeting room. And so she worked on this for an entire month and she said, I'm going to be five minutes early to every meeting. And she worked on it. And yes, just like you said, I I debriefed with her and I said, how does it feel? She's like, wow, I came and I could breathe. I got to connect with people relationally before the meeting started. My brain was not fuzzy and I just felt like a million bucks. So I'm going to keep that habit. So it was just like you said. Yeah. And and I think that um, those are the kind of things that you can see from the outside looking in and people can't see that about themselves because they're in the fray of it. And they're like, well, you know, yeah, that that's a good point. And yeah, that I do feel that way because of and I'm going to do it again. And it's kind of like the old cliche. I know that it's it's um, I've heard it for years, but, you know, negative motivation doesn't work. It's that positive motivation. You 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 strive and want to do the things that make you feel good. And I think even Tony Robbins teaches, you know, people are more apt to go towards something they like than away from something they don't like. So how can you set those things in your life to draw you toward them? You know, having those goals, but having a reason why behind them. And, and realizing that you feel good right now because you prepared and aren't late to the meeting, so why don't you do it again? And then it gets back to the Pavlov's dog reaction. So you go, if I did this, I feel this way, then ding, and I'm going to do it again. <laughs> You're right. You've got to connect to the why. I think it's Simon Sinek. You know, it's all about the why. Mm-hmm. And so I have to always connect my clients, especially the ones that want to lose weight or be more on time or whatever that thing is that they've, for 30 years, they've been doing the same thing. They really have to reconnect to the why and what's it going to look like on the other side of that and keep that in front of you. And like you said, state it, state your goals positively, not like I'm going to quit smoking, but you know, I want to be healthy to be around for my grandkids, you know, or whatever that, that big why is. And if they can connect to that and keep it in front of them, there's a better chance that they're going to succeed. Yep. Because they're pulled towards something, not pushed away from something, and yeah. and I think that really, really does it. So I, I think we could probably talk for about 428 more hours and and still be <laughs> scratching the surface. So we probably better just wind her up and and let's. Uh, what's the best way that people can learn more about you and your programs and your books? Um, how can they reach out to you? Uh, a few ways. One way would be my website, paulcasey.org, P-A-U-L-C-A-S-E-Y.org. Not, not, not .com because that's the professional golfer. And as much as oh. I want to be a better golfer, don't do .com. Do paulcasey.org. Um, through Facebook, Growing Forward Services, Twitter, at Growing FWD, and uh, LinkedIn, Paul D. Casey are some ways to get in touch with me. And I'm sure all of the social media links are on your main website, so paulcasey.org um, would have the main contacts. So super time chatting with you. Thank you so much, and I appreciate you being on the program. It was fun. Thanks. Have a, have a prosperous year, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.